Get your drop, get your drop. We got drop enchiladas. We got drop tamales. We got drop strudels. Man, shout out to uh, my homie, man. Shout out to the family, HOS. HOS Design, man. A couple of amazing designs, man. I've just been putting them up here, man, just to see what the family, you know what I'm saying, vibrates. And I've been getting some amazing feedback, some great responses, man. This dragon on the wall is incredible. When you zoom in, you can see the dragon scales, man. I mean, peace and power, man. Shabbat Shalom, man. Baruch, Pesach, man. We are flowing. I'm just kicking back, man. I, I just saw an amazing uh, video from the sister Israel's Redemption. Uh, I think it's one of her newest drops, and it just reminded me of so much that I said, ah, oh, man. All right, man. Let's go, man. <laughs> let go, man. Because I know it's 3 in the morning. I should sleep, but nah, let go, man. Let go, man. Love to the family, man. Just dropping it, man, in the, in the ether all day, man. Uh, love to the family, Dawi. Got some great drag and drop, man, to dig on. Might be a good little dismount, man. You know what I mean? Historic drop. We're going to dig on some of this, man. This is incredible drop. Uh, Slavonic conquest of the world, man. I mean, hey, we're going to dig on some of that. You know what I'm saying? Love to Sister Carol Hill dropping that drop. Yeah, man, I try to get to it, man. I know I'm not that fast, but I try to get to it, man. Tune in tomorrow, man. Saturday, 5 o'clock Pacific. Crystal Essentials, man. Let's go. Shout out to Ty Battle, man. Dropping all these great books. Get the book drop, man. Even before it hits the library, you can go over here and just surf the wave and get the book drop, man. And always come and show that a high, man. Show that a high, man. Man, we got some link drop, man. I mean, I'm just scrolling so you can dig on it. You get the water. You get the water. You get the water. Links and books. Links and books. Links and books. Edible and medicinal plants. That's some good survival drop, man. Tune in every Sunday. This Sunday, man. 5 o'clock Pacific. Survival drop. Five minutes. Might save your life, man. All right? Might save your whole life. All right, man. Then you always get the radio shows as well, man. So, Caramel, what it do? You already know. All right, man. All right, man. All right, man. All right. So let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Dragons on the wall. I want to get right into it. And then we're just going to surf the wave on out, man. That's it, man. Fall back. Yeah, man. You heard the title, man. You read the title. The Genuine Blackamoor Native American Darkies, man. Yeah, I know, man. Love to Israel's redemption. Israel's redemption. Sister been uh, doing tremendous work, man. So much scholarship going into... You know, all of her uh, platform, her flow, her published works, man, support her published works. That's the next stage. I mean, that's the inspiration for all of us is to, you know, yet yeah, it's, it's great to, you know, recon and put it together. But you have to be able to put it together in a published form so that others can, you know, literally pick it up and hold it and have it with them and read it. You know what I'm saying? When the Internet is down, you can't depend on this stuff. So that's definitely an inspiration to me. I look forward to taking that step very, very soon. So, Ahab, Israel's redemption. We're going to surf the wave, and, you know, we're just digging on it, man. It's, it's ain't no, you know, we just, it's just so much great drop in here. We got to dig on it, man. So, let's surf the wave. I let go. Ahab, fair use, uh, you know, copyright 107, teaching scholarship. Do, 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 do. All right, man, let's go, man. Kayok. On this video, I said I was going to share some some pictures with you. Um, these are some old pictures, and I just wanted to show you some pictures of, of us indigenous people, as well as some historical documentation about us as well. And the first thing I want to do is show you a picture. This picture here. Let's say you were in a store, and you saw him walking, and maybe he dropped his wallet. But you couldn't catch him in time. So you went up to the front desk at customer service to see if they could possibly contact him from the information in his wallet. Only problem is there's no ID in there. So the person at customer service says, uh, could you describe his face? You said you saw him before. Could you please describe him? Now, some of you would probably say, the first thing you would probably say, um, he's a black man, yay tall, right? 
That's how you would probably describe him. Well, this is Mr. Woody Strode. Um, he was Cherokee. He was Creek. He was also an actor. Um, if you look up information about him, uh, for those who did not know him well, they may describe him as black, African-American. And I've actually seen some reports from way back when when they described him as Negro because that's what they called us as well. But like I said, this is Mr. Woody Strode. I'm going to show you an article um, that has a little bit of a write-up about him. And this was when he was uh, getting ready to compete in the decathlon. So here's the article. Dave Anderson writes about athletes with good and bad timing in the decathlon. Less known was the expected duel for the gold medal in the 1936 decathlon between two Californians, Woody Strode, the great black American Indian, and the great white hope, Glenn Morris. So this was an article about him. Now this is a picture of Mr. Strode in his old age. And this is a picture of him in a role that he played in a movie. Now, you should ask yourself, why would they have him playing the, the part of an American Indian? Because that's who he was. Now I want to show you, this is the definition of the N-word that you will find in the Oxford English Dictionary. Now I always suggest that you look, uh, that you refer to very old books. And this is before they started to try and replace the truth with their lies. So if you look up the N-word, we're going to go down to number three. Now, the way they're trying to define it nowadays is not going to wash. But they have here a dark-skinned person of any origin. BS. Bullsh. However, in early U.S. usage, it was usually with reference to American Indians. And you see how Mr. Stroh was just described in the article about him. I want to show you this little snippet from a book. Britain in 20 Minutes. Uh, this is a page. I uh, want the page from it. Let's start from the very top. He is going way down south to sunny <coughs> South Dakota, in fact, to see the genuine Native American darkies, the <laughs> real Yankee blackamores. Oh, man. <laughs> hey, man. Time out, man. Uh, Israel Redemption, my sister, you're doing a fabulous job. Please uh, keep on, uh, you know, letting the people know what time it is, man. And again, it's all about, you know, unifying, you know what I'm saying? It, it's it's literally, you know, energy, frequency, vibration, you know. not It's not a mental thing. It's not a knowledge thing, you know. This is a wisdom thing. This is an energy thing. This is a framer-shaper connection, you know what I mean? So, you know, that's the beauty of the unity, you know what I mean? Yeah, man. You thought I was making this shit up, man. <laughs> you thought I was making this up, man. The Sister Yisrael Redemption is showing us, man. Okay. All right, man. The genuine Native American darkies. The real Yankee Blackamoor, man. The Blackamoor, man. We're just talking... Great, man. We're talking greatness, right? Because we know when you want more of something, you want a greater quantity, quantity, a greater quantity. You, you want more. These people have more than those people. They have more. Great. We're going to get into Mongol, and it's going to have the same definition when we dig on great. And that might clear a lot of the Tartarian situation up, you know, we talk about these swarthy, indigenous, you know what I'm saying, uh, tribes of Yashara, you feel me, they're just calling you, first they're calling you niggers, right, niggers, Indians, then they're calling you darkies, you heard that before, all right, darkie, you know, you gotta, see, you know, I'm crossing the street, you gotta move out the way, you know what I mean, all these darky references, you know what I mean? Darkies, darkies, darkies. Native American darkies. <laughs> as crazy as it sounds, this only lends more to the body bag of who you are. Because ain't no 
Tonto Proxy Indian can claim to be a Native American darky. You dig? <laughs> I mean, you got to use all that shit against them. Oh, okay, we're darkies. Well, that means that we're the con, right? That means we're not tripping. We're not tripping. We're not tripping, right? Oh, darky, uh, you know, get out the way, darky. Get out the way, darky, right? We were just talking about the Americans. I'm saying, man, I mean, hey, <laughs> think we're playing, but is it play play? Because when you talk the definition of the con, the priesthood, you're talking the copper color races or the darkies, man. When you talk the aboriginals, man, you're talking the darkies, man. But, you know, we're not really speaking English. You know what I'm saying? Because we know what they're saying. We know what they want us to feel about ourselves. You know what I'm saying? They want us to feel destitute of light. You know? A dark atmosphere is one which prevents vision. They want you to have no vision, no light. You remember Henry Brown said in the delegation, the Virginia delegation, he said, uh, if we can succeed, if we can prevent light from entering the slave's mind, we would have succeeded. And they would be equivalent to the beast of the field if we can shut the light from entering their minds so they can be dark, so they can be darkies, right? Yeah, man. This is what they did to the car. They shut the light from the priest, the priesthood. So you can't see clearly copper colored people. Oh no. Well, we're copper colored too. Nah, man. I'm specifically, specifically referring to the darkies, man. Or those that they wish to be destitute of light. They also call you the real black or more, man. Come on, man. You know better. Love to Aqua Time, man. She she saw us complaining about that link that they took down at least on one computer. Another computer, I can get it. <laughs> we were just talking about the roots. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Mongo, you know, on the dismount. But we're talking about the roots, right? Okay. And this is uh, some great drop. I'm going to leave it in the link because this is all, you know, when we talk about the roots, the picks. We're talking about your family, all right? The Pictish race, right? We're talking about those that connect with Clan Ross or Rus or Rusha, right? Jerusalem. Let's go. We can get all into the history, but specifically when we talk Blackamore, because that's what they that's what they said, right? The real Blackamore. Okay, all right. The real Blackamore. You gotta know they're just talking about you. The real black and more. To see the genuine Native American, right? Copper colored races. The genuine Native, natural, original, copper colored darkies. The real. Blackamore. The real Blackamore. When you know. That's what they're calling you. We know, we know we're talking about the tribes, man. Let's see if they'll let me get it up here. Okay. Sometimes, man, all right, they be tripping sometimes. You know we're just talking about the lost tribes of Israel, man. And yet they're still labeling you a Saracen, right? Even here, they're still labeling you a Saracen, right? 
But you know the war on Israel, the declaration is popping off officially right here in 1452, where it literally says we weighing all the singular premises with due meditation and noting that we had formerly by others of ours granted, among other things, free and apple faculty to the aforesaid King Alfonso to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, subdue all Saracens. I mean, can you dig it? Subdue all Saracens. Copper color races found here. Black and more darkies. Saracens head. When we're just talking the lost tribes of Israel identity. Come on, man. We're talking the royal families. We're talking the Templar. We're talking Kalelus. We're talking the Remani. The Ramon, the Pomegranate, the Promised Land. We're dodging the hijack. Yes, we're talking Mu. Yes, we're talking more. Yes, we're talking great, great ones. And the crazy thing is, when we talk great ones, man, I mean, man, uh, <laughs> when you talk M Mongol and Mongolian and Mongolia, and we're going to get this a little further. When you talk the Mongols, the problem is that these words are already used in an altogether different meaning. So there's been a shift of meanings from the Middle Age or medieval meaning to the current meaning. Mongolia, what they mean today, is a misnomer. We're researchers, so we know we got to read between the lines. We often use the words Mongolia and Mongols inevitably confusing the readers despite our intention. Now they're trying to confuse us. Because, oh boy, what comes out when we dig on it is that when we talk From one hand, we are referring to the same phenomenon as, histor as historians, the Great Mongolian Empire, with its in center in Russia. Russia, right? We're just talking the Rus, R-U-S, is R-E-W-S. Rus is Rus. Hey, so the great Mongolian Empire with its center in Rus, Rusha, or the Golden Horde. See, these are the Mongols, the Russians. Why? Because Mongols only means great. Unlike historians of the Romanovian school, we suggest that great equals Mongolian Empire. Great equals Mongolian Empire. Empire. Again, Church Slavic had been the official language of the great equals Mongolian. We couldn't think of another word to replace the term Mongols, which translates as the great ones. But we know now that there's been a inevitably confusing the readers despite our intention. There's there's been this, uh, it's just referring, the problem is that these words are already used in altogether different meaning. There's been a different meaning attached, but the medieval or the original or the middle age meaning, the OG meaning of Mongo is great ones, the great ones. Just like you want more, you have a greater amount, you you're the Moors. You're the great ones. You're from Mu. We're talking great, man. We're talking Drakkar. We're talking fire, water, ether, and earth, land, man. It's all about your land. And it's all about the darky, right? The Blackamoor, man. It's all about the Blackamoor, man. We know it's all about the Blackamoor. 
or what? Or the Negro. Blackamoor. Negro. Blackamoor. Negro. Saracen. Negro. Blackamoor. Indian. Nigger. Darky. American. Negro. Blackamoor. Saracen. To invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens. And that's what we got when we were talking about the Ho Ho Kam. Remember the definition of Ho Ho Kam, a member of a Native American culture flourishing from about 3rd century BC to mid 15th century AD in southern or south central Arizona, noted for the construction of an extensive system of irrigation canals. That's what the Aztec do, right? That's what the Toltec do. You talk about master builders from Old Ham or Huhugam. Those who are gone from Hugog, Huhog to perish, to disappear. To disappear. Do you understand? Do we overstand? Do we understand? Do we understand what they did? When the ho ho Kong disappeared, man. Man, love to the tribe, man. I mean, this is all recon from Drop Nation collectively, man. Ho ho Kong, Arizona. What's up here? You dog. Alright, we talked about the Magalan magic. This is Manan or Mananan or Maine. Before Maine was over there on the East Coast, so to speak. This is Manan or Dananan, connected to the tribes of Dan or, or, or Tuatha de Danan. Tuatha de Dunan is connected to this four corners. We're talking the whole, whole calm. Those who what? Those who gone, who are gone, perished, or disappeared. These are the Saracens. Come on. These are the Black and Moor. These are the Negro. Come on, man. To disappear means that you were vanquished. You were invaded, searched out, captured. You were vanquished. And this is who they're subduing all saracens and all saracens are all negroes so let's read it correctly shall we to invade search out capture vanquish and subdue all negro people take their royalty take their milk and honey their pearls and gold do what and other enemies of their Isus, wherever place, and the kingdoms. Take their kingdoms, man. Come on, man. Say play, play. Take their kingdoms, man. Everything has a meaning. <laughs> Take their kingdoms, man. Come on, man. Break it down. Break it all the way down. Take their kingdoms, man. This means wisdom is the conqueror of fortune. Wisdom conquers fortune. The model for the Andrews coat of arms displayed here is Victrice Fortuna Sapientia. Wisdom is the conqueror of fortune. It's all about mama. Take their kingdoms, right? Their principalities. Their dukedoms. Let's read the rest. We're just talking about the Negro, man. The Blackamoor, right? The Blackamoor, right? The American darky. The real Blackamoor. Take their what? Their kingdoms. Dukedoms. Principalities. Dominions. Possessions. 
all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them, and to reduce them, their persons, to perpetual slavery. Now we pick up on the slave trade, right? The narrative. Now we pick up on this need to permanently invade and colonize and put the people in perpetual slavery, even debt-based slavery, even birth certificate, you know what I'm saying, uh, primary creditor slavery, you know what I'm saying, collateral slavery on all levels, perpetually, and to apply it appropriate to himself and his successors, the kingdom's duped him, counter principality. So all their successors, or as it says here, but now applied to the descendants, which are the successors of the Europeans born in America. Descendants, which are the successors, appropriate to himself and his successors, the kingdoms and all this, and to convert them to his or her use or profit. <laughs> Who? The successors get the profit. The descendants get the profit. They're now the Khan. They're the American. You're African-American, buddy. We're just talking about those that were vanquished. We're talking about those that disappeared. Right here. Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Colorado. This is priest-king territory. How do you know? <laughs> Come on, man. We got it on the map. Notice they got America properly in the east, not the west. You're in the east. Prester John, priest king, is right over the four corners. King David, priest king, right over Judah or Udah. Awahudah. You think it's play play? Do you think it's play play? Prester John, right where the ho ho come. Where's the descendants of Prester John? Where's the real ones? Where's my people, my people? Where's my people? Where'd they go? You know what I mean? I mean these are all decent questions to ask when you talk about those that are disappearing. When you talk about the Negro, the darkie, right? I'm just saying, that's what they saying. I'm just saying, that's what they saying. Remember this document, man, the, myth, the Mythical Straits of Antion, page 162. We're just talking Preston John. Developing the idea further, we're talking Marco Polo. After the discovery of the mainland north of Isthmus, we find that the maker of the MS map illustrated in outline has placed Prester John and his idolatrous neighbors Remember, we're fighting Canaanites over here, not very far from Mexico. Prester John is placed not very far from Mexico, not very far from Mexico, not very far from Mexico. The darkies, the blackamoor, the moor, the great ones, the mongol, great ones. This is Cathay. This is India superior. This is the real China. This is the real Asia. The real Silk Road. Place Prester John. Not very far from Mexico. Okay. Alright. You know, we just digging around, man. I mean, love to the sister Yisra's redemption. She got this popping off. She got this popping off. And you can get a lot in this drop right here. This is Preston John number 41. We're about to get 42. And then we're going to do like a 43 through 45 sprint. I mean, we got a lot coming up when, you get, when we dig on the priest king Preston John. Because even in the great document called The Races of Men by Robert Knox on page 167. Here's a hypothesis. The last hypothesis, I believe, offered the credulous for the peopling of America. This is an incredible hypothesis for the peopling of America. Listen up. Listen up to the credulous 
hypothesis for the peopling of America, always accepting that standby of the thoroughbred theorist, namely that the copper Indians, copper Indians, the darkies, the blackamoors, who have kingdoms and principalities and dukedoms and all these things, movable, immovable, good, the vanquished ones, the whole calm. We're talking the four corners, right? We're talking Judah, right? Judah, right? Thoroughbred there is namely that the copper Indians, that is the true Americans, were the lost tribes of Israel who fled there on rafts I suppose headed by Prester John. The true Americans, the true Americans, the Copper Indians are the true Americans following their priest king. Prester means priest, John means king, that's all that means. Following their priest king, Prester John. We're talking Hawata, we're talking Tecumseh, these are all priest kings. We're talking Joshua. We're talking Quetzalcoatl, right? We're just talking the same old thing, right? You're talking Joshua like a book of the beginnings, Gerald Massey, all right? As Shu and Anhar in Egyptian mythology and Moses and Joshua conducted their people with the solar orb around the si circle of signs overcoming the uh, opposing powers postulated by the early men, so in the Toltec, we're talking Sylvanus Toltecs, Solomon the Builder, in the Toltec mythology, Hawamak, Hawamatzin, and Kitsukoto, Kitsukoto, the rainbow dragon, right? Conducted their people through the pilgrimage and wanderings recorded in their picture writings. Hawamak, like Moses, wrote the code of laws for the nation and conducted the civil government. Kitsukoto, in relation to Hawamak, plays the part of Joshua. When Kitsukoto began to give the laws instead of Hawamak, he sent a cry to the top of the mountain of Alkrai, whose voice could be heard for 300 miles around. Joshua follows Moses as the leader of Israel and instructs the people to go up to Jericho, his mountain of Alkrai, man. We're talking the old red land was the name of the original home of the north from which the Toltecs migrated. Their leader, Kitsukoto, Wore a robe marked with crosses. What crosses? We're talking the Hebrew towel. The towel. The towel. This ain't no play play. Dig in, man. Kitsukoto attained the land of promise. You're talking pomegranate, Ramon, or Roman. And these are the Romans we're digging on in Kalelus in 775 and all the stuff that we're digging on. Gets a goal to attain the land of promise. And in his golden reign of it, an ear of wheat grew so large that one man could hardly carry it. Then they're going to talk about, you know, saying land of milk and honey. Man, I mean, we're just talking Moses and Joshua comparing it to Kitsukoto. to hell. Even the Mormons have to claim Kitsukoto. to. We're saying it's Joshua. They say Jesus, phantoms and duplicates. Kitsukoto is Dodge the Hijack, a white bearded guy, Dodge the Hijack, because this is who they want you. This is the image, right? No images, no images, no images. But they want to get it in your in inception, in your weaker mind, you know, about this image, right? So Kitsukoto, all right? or the serpent god, or the dragon king, let's go, from the legend of Kitsukoto of the ancient Aztecs, listen up, in Mormon circles, he is often identified with Jesus Christ, in Mormon circles, he is identified with Jesus, because he brought his people to the promised land, and now they know that this is the real Mashiach, so they have to claim they're going there for a reason. All right? Joseph Smith is going to Utah for a reason. He ain't just bullshitting. He knows he's in Judah. He knows he's claiming Joshua as the priest king he is. But in their religion, this is what they have to use. Jesus Christ. You have to figure out the rest.
but they're giving you the drop. Kitsukoto plays is all they saying. Kitsukoto must play heavy if they're going to, you know, make him the Mashiach. Is it because, I mean, he wore a robe, he wore a robe, long robe marked with crosses? Kitsukoto wore a long robe marked with crosses, man? Huh? What are we talking about? We're talking to Hoho Kam, the ones that disappeared, right? In reality, we're talking to people of Prester John. Prester John, who again, in the races of men, these Indians, these copper Indians, the true Americans, were the lost tribes of Israel who fled there on rafts headed, I suppose, by Prester John, the priest king. We already got the drop. We already got the drop when we start digging on Prester John. I mean, even better than that. Even better than that. Oh, they got a different. Uh, gotta dig it up like this. Did a <laughs> black man discover fountain of youth? Press the jar. Oh man, that took a lot of work. That took a lot of work, man. But, I mean, honestly, it's a fair question when we talk Preston John. Did a black man discover the fountain of youth? Oh, now we're just talking Florida, right? <laughs> this is Priest King Preston John. This is El Preste Juan, Emperor, Emperado de los Abyssinios. Abyssinios is what they called Ethiopia before they called it Ethiopia, which is also a Greek word. And we know that Ethiopia is a vague term for wherever darkies are. So this is the original Ethiopia here. This is the original China and India again. They call this place what? India Superior. Florida. Look at over here. China. La China. India. Cateo is Cathay where they get Catholic. Now you got the Romans popping off right here which is just Reman or Remani which means pomegranate or promised land. This is where the whole whole calm is rocking, right? This is where Preston John is rocking, right? Right here in India Superior or Grand Tartary, right? China. Let go. So we know it all connects. Let's get some more, man, because it's getting too good. It's getting too good. Again, the genuine Native American darkies, the real black amor. And we know what the black Moor is. It's just the Negro. And they went to war against the Negro. They went to war and they gave the kingdom to their successors or their descendants. And that's who took the con. But keep it going. We are in the classroom of my sister, Yisrael Redemption. So, even they recognize that we Moors are who? Native American. American Indian, indigenous. In their own book, they refer to us as Black Amours down in South Dakota, Native American Darkies. I want to show you a picture from a really old book um, of an original Sioux. This is a page that was torn out of this book. I don't know which book it came from, but at the bottom it says the Sioux in South Dakota. And you see how he's dressed. Now I'll show you. I think this is a flyer. It may be a playbill. You can see the N-word at the top. Of course, it was produced by the Caucasusoid. That nasty little copper-colored coon. See, these are the bywords and little names they had for us. And this one's a picture. This is from a book that was written by Maynard Dixon. And the title is Engine Babies. Stories and Drawings. And how do those children look? Like your children? Like our children? Now, how many of you remember the crayon that was in the Crayola box? And the color was Indian red. Bang. I remember that because I have that color. 
in my box. I had a huge, it was a huge box of Crayola crayons. And that color was in there. But this is the picture of it. Somebody still had it. Somebody still had a box of those crayons and they kept it. And they had that color. They took a picture of it. Now some of you or one of your relatives who was a Boy Scout may still have the old Boy Scouts of America pen that featured the profile of Chief Cornstalk. This is an old Boy Scouts of America pen. But notice his hair, because someone wanted to know, what do we call our hair? Okay? Just right quick, she's doing a great job. She's about to go into uh, uh, the copper, the copa, which is, you know, really dope. She said cornstalk. You know, it just reminded me of something Coombsay research. I don't know, you know. I'm just going to put it in. Maybe I'll go into it another time. But I just want to put it in to remind myself of what's going on. Yeah, see, there's a connection with this cornstalk. And this Tacombe is 1812 situation, right? The comma, the Tacombe say. I just want to see what it was uh, saying, what the relation is. I'm just belly flopping, man. Yeah, See, you know, yeah, I know, I know, I know this was real intimate, you know what I mean, this story, um, and there's different sides to it, I'm sure, you know what I mean, but, uh, you know, since both sides stayed in place and sporadic musket fire continued into early evening, Cornstalk then received word from his scouts that the expected 300 militia company was approaching from the rear, the Shawnee then disengaged and slid back across the Ohio River without interference in the militia camp, the soldiers declared themselves the victors, but they had suffered great damage. 52 militia men lay dead along with half of their officers. Another 88 were wounded so badly that they could not continue with the campaign. The Shawnee only suffered 22 killed and 18 wounded. Cornstalk led the Shawnee retreat on horseback all the way to Scotio, Scotio, Sco, Scoto. Skoto villages. Another council was held and it was decided the Shawnee should make peace with Lord Dunmar because his two armies were now marching toward the villages and far outnumbered the Shawnee warriors. Colonel Lewis and militia crossed the Ohio River, marched on the Pickaway Plains where a number of Shawnee villages existed along the Skoto River and Skippo Creek. Lewis was gathering his men for an attack on the Shawnee when Lord Dunmore arrived with his troops, Dunmore explained that the Shawnee were willing to make peace, but Lewis would hear none of it. He continued his march on Shawnee until Dunmore rode after him and threatened to kill Lewis if he persisted. Lewis backed down, and a new war was averted. Now, I know there was um, there was some type of vote, you know, that they had with Cornstalk and Tecumseh. But, you know, we'll get another time, you know, just, uh. I know all this is intertwined. But, yeah, dig on it, man. Dig on this relationship. And, you know, it just reminds us that, you know, we got to keep continue our investigation, you know, as we put our story together. You know what I mean? As we put it all together. The coom say a shawnee and or cornstalk is sometimes corn silk. Huh. The tribes were rebuilding the tribe. The tribes were rebuilding the tribes. Most have been masculine. So what they're trying to say, it's all the same person. The coom say a shawnee and or cornstalk is sometimes corn silk. That's kind of, you know, I'm just, you know, just belly flopping, man. Just trying to see what's up. Yeah, there's something more to it. There's something to the store. There's something to the store. Let's get it, though. But check out the fro, man. Check out the fro. That's the point, man. And uh, you already know.
who to call him the Indian or the Negro or the Black and more. All right, let's go. His hair is just like our hair. And you saw the picture of Mr. Strode as well. Um, I'll show you in our, I'll show you in the language dictionary, what we call our hair. Okay, so one of the words that we use for our hair when it's not processed with any chemicals or has not been permanently altered is kappa. Okay, that's what we use. The word is kappa. Uh, there are different verb forms that we use. And so they have kappa. And they also have cop here. But we don't say cop. We say it a different way. But it basically refers to our hair when it has not been chemically processed or permanently altered. Uh, when it's still in its natural state. Um, now the word that they have here for canopy is also the word we use for our hair, kupa. And we have another form called kupawa. And some of you may, uh, may pronounce it as kupawa. But it's a... Raise your hand if you used to get your hair straightened with a hot comb. I did. Um, of course, our people invented those tools, and we've been straightening our hair for generations. I know there's something that we use that our ancestors put in our hair, you know, to straighten it. And it, it would make it, like, super, super wavy and really, really shiny. I know how to, I still know how to make that. Um, but, like I said, the word is kupawa. And we use that expression because the when they're stretching out your curls and they're putting a hot comb on it to stretch it out or straighten it, they blow on it. Remember how they would blow on it? Right at the area where they would have the comb, you know, to keep the heat and the steam, you know, from burning your scalp. Just to uh, get this right. Remember clear. how they would blow on it? Right at the area where they would have the comb, you know, to keep the heat and the steam, you know. You know, down here, if you can see it, it says a fist. And it got me thinking about the capoeira, which you say capa, capa. And I'm thinking about the, about the Brazilian, the, the indigenous martial arts. And then, bang, a fist pops up, you know what I mean? Hasty flight, you know, cover bell, I mean, act covertly, protect, protect, protect. And that got me thinking about this Brazilian martial art form called capoeira. Capa, capa, you know. All things connected. Let's go. Great job. They blow on it. Remember how they would blow on it? Right at the area where they would have the comb, you know, to keep the heat and the steam, you know, from burning your scalp. Um, of course, in our language, we use the word poa. All right. So in reference to our head, we Pow wow. Pow wow. We say kapoa. Uh, for hair that's been straightened with heat. So the, those are the words. That also the kapoeta, the pow the blow. Blow, you know what I mean? The pawa, kapawara. We use for our hair. We do not call our hair afro. Uh, those are terms that are from Hamites. We're not Hamites. But, you know, for those who are wondering. So, that's the picture of Chief Cornstalk. That's his hair. And um, it looks like it's in its natural state as well. And I also want to share this one with you. Um... I've been contacted by some of you who live down in uh, Central America and wanting to know if you related to me. And I said, there's a 99.999% .999 chance you are. Uh, a man by the name of Peter Martyr wrote about so-called Negroes. This is how he referred to my people. And this is how they referred to us back in the day. Living in Central America before the introduction of slavery and says... These were the first Negroes seen in the Indies. Now, at the bottom, someone put a note down here. The Costa Chicans say they are not, they insist, the descendants of African slaves. There was never slavery here, even in ancient times. They say their ancestors did not come from Africa. They've always been here. Of course we have. This is our land. Now, this one I really wanted to show you all. Because I uh, sometimes I get some of the craziest comments from people who were just so angry that I would dare say Mongols invaded the Americas. Let me uh, say something to you. You're either a liar and you know it when you claim Mongols never invaded the Americas or you really are that ignorant. Either way is really sad. But this is from a very old text and it's entitled Conquest of Peru and Mexico in the 13th century by the Mongols. Let me give some more details on here. You also 
There's some great details in this book. Love to Care Mayo, who dropped the full PDF. We got it right now in the drop library. Password is 1234 to get through the dough at 432thedrop.com. Um, and this this flows exactly where where we're at in our recon. And we, you know, we just share recon when we talk about the Mongols. Because in this book, the invasion that's taking place mainly is the Genghis Khan invasion. And this is who invaded the priest king Prester John. You know what I'm saying? When you talk Preston John, Fountain of Youth, you know, we talk Kalelus and which means promised land, the Romani culture, the the Ramon, the Pomegranate. This was invaded in twelve hundreds or twelve oh two, twelve oh three by Genghis Khan, who is who is really connected to the Tartary business, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, they'll call us, uh, you know, all kind of other things, you know, Nestorian, this and that. Um, but the Tartars mainly are this Genghis Khan connection. And these are what this Mongol, what this book is referring to when Batu Khan, which is connected with the Inca in this book. Um, it's a lot, man. I mean, it's a lot of dropping this when it, when you go through the Mongu Khan and Manke, Manke, Mangu, and all these became the lineage of, or, you know, the continuation, whatever you want to call it, of the Inca. All right. The Mongol itself is, <laughs> this is India superior. You know what I'm saying? This is India superior. So when we talk Mongol again, all we are referring to is the great ones. When we talk Mongolian or Mongolia, we're talking about the great empire. Dodge all the rest of the hijack or the great kingdom. What great kingdom? The same great kingdom in 1452 that they took out simultaneously, whether we're talking in Spain over there and, 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 and the exile of the Hebrews on that side, the Saracens, the Negroes, wherever we were, all right? Or we're talking, you know what I'm saying, the Marukan. Again, we weighing all singular premises with due meditation to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, subdue all Saracens and do what? take their kingdoms, right? So this kingdom here is what we're referring to right here as the great kingdom, or as they refer to on these maps as India superior, the great kingdom, grand Tartary. And who's rocking here? Priest King Preston John. Did a black man discover the fountain of youth? Or are we just talking about Solomon and David and they already had a connection with the secrets, they're guarding the vortexes already. We're talking about those that these Hebrews are being led by. Prester John, Israel, David, El Prester Juan, Priest King. So that's all we're talking about with Mongols. And then the invasion is the Genghis Khan invasion on Israel, on Prester John, on King David. And that's why... Genghis Khan took the title Khan. He started being called a Khan, even though he's not a real Khan. The priesthood was hijacked. And he also took the title David because he wanted to be a David. He wanted to be a David. He wanted to be a David. And he wanted to rock out, but he couldn't, he couldn't have this promised land, right? He couldn't have this promised land that the whole, whole Khan is holding down. Anasazi, Magali, we're talking Udaw, right? We're talking Udaw, which means we must be talking Mormons. <laughs> yeah, babe, we're talking Udaw, we must be talking Mormons. And if we're talking Mormons, we're just talking Kids of Kota, man. And if we're talking Kids of Kota, we're just talking Joshua. And this is where the whole drop comes in, especially when you start talking about the timelines, man. Because when you start looking at it, right, they say Jesus, right? But let's just uh, surf the wave and say, okay, you know, I'll read this part right here. It says, let us remind the reader that in Chronicle 1, all right, one of his first books, one of his first books of the series, Anatoly Fermanko formulated, Fermanko is this chronologer in Russia who's putting together chronology, man, that is, is getting rid of the duplicates and phantoms and putting it back together because they stretched out our timeline. This is big. The chronology plays. If you're not factoring this in, then it's not, it's not going to make sense how Israel was just taken down 
in the 1300s and 1400s, not in no BCs or early ADs, all right? For Manco formulated the hypothesis, hypothesis of how the chronological shifts came into being, including the millenarian one, the first figure of one, presumed to stand for a thousand. They added over a thousand years to all native people on all native lands. So what we think happened thousands of years, over a thousand years ago, it just happened. This is the spell we're under, where we think our history is way back. This just, we just got invaded in Jerusalem, man. We're talking Columbus, man. We're just, we're saying it just happened, all right? The first figure of one presumed to stand for a thousand today and introduce this captivity as recently as the 13th century, 1200s, who was pressed to jar. This was the original invasion, not of the great ones, the Mongols, the great ones, the Mongols, but we're talking about specifically Genghis Khan, Chinggis, Zingis, Chan, all right? Presumed to stand for a thousand today, introduce this capacity as recent as the 12th or 13th century, 1200s, had originally transcribed as the letter I or J. So when you're looking at these dates and it says 1740, does that one, does that one really stand for an I which is an Iesus or later a J. Are we really saying that this is 740 years after the birth of the Mashiach, which they're calling Jesus, <laughs> which the Mormons don't call Jesus. I mean, the Mormons don't call yo Jesus, Jesus. They're calling Kitsukoltu, who is Joshua, who led his people to the promised land. Joshua, kids are called to attain the land of promise, which is the Ramon, Ramon, Ramani. Is that what we're really talking about again? Presumed to stand for a thousand today and introduce this capacity as recent as the 12th century, 13th century, 1200s, originally transcribed as the letter I or J or the first name of the name Jesus Jesus but who are they referring to what Mashiach are they referring to therefore the symbol I in the transcription of the dates like 1995 like 1812 could have initially stood for the name of Jesus or Joshua or Kitsukoltu or whatever priest king Mashiach we're referring to. Remember Anatoly Fermenko, he dates the birth of the Mashiach, not in no 5 BC or whatever the case is, but based on astrological signs, how the so called, you know, everything was lined up, you know, astronomically, whatever. <laughs> You know, he dates all that to, I think, uh, even uh, either 1154, 1054 A.D. That's the only time, you know, lining up the star of Bethlehem, all the stuff that they're trying to put. The only time that all that happened was 1154 or it was 1054, one of those. Um, and 1054, I believe, is what they're really leaning on because that's what would make sense if, if they're... If the Mashiach was born in 1054 A.D., according to Fermenko, in his recon, not mine, his recon, then that's really year one. And that's what he was saying in all those chronology books, is that year one is 1054. Look, we don't know for sure what time it is, but at least we can decipher the date to put together... <laughs> Man, to put together when the Mashiach was born, right? When are you talking Joshua? You're not talking Jesus. And then that at least gives you some further orientation. So if you're talking about the year 1995, you're really talking about 995 years after the birth of a Joshua or a Mashiach. A Mashiach was born 995 years ago, if it was 1995. You dig? That one is just an I, man. Standing for Iesus or Iesu or Iesu. 
like the Oaspi says, Isu, which just means like you're a prophet or you're Mashiach. So if we are putting this together, and if we're just surfing the wave, and we're talking about 1740, stood for set the 740th year since who they're calling Jesus here again. <laughs> Well, the Mormons, who they call Jesus, is simply Quetzalcoatl, man, the priest king. We're talking to Aztec, the Maya, man, who led his people to the promised land, man. And if you're Joshua, if you're Mashiach Joshua that led you to the promised land, was born in 1054, then you don't have no room for some secondary Jesus that supposedly was born in... 5 BC, man. Can you see that they added thousands of years to your timeline to create this story? They had to push your real history back. They had to push Kitsukoto way back in the super BCs, man. Because all we're talking about is that 1740 or let's say 1812, since we've been talking about 1812 a lot, that's just 812 years after the birth of Joshua, after the birth of Kitsukoto, who also says he's going to return and, you know, all that too. After the birth of Kitsukoto. That's all it's saying is that this is 812 years after the birth of that Mashiach. It's not really telling you what, what what's the date. It's just saying that according to... You know, if I start at year one of the birth of Joshua or the birth of Kitsukoto, if I start at year one, then it's 812 years since that point. It's not telling you what the date is. That's why the BCs are such bullshit. Bullcrap. BC stands for bullcrap. <laughs> All right, we're just talking chronology, putting some dates together so we know we're talking Kitsukoto. And again... I mean, how does that line up, let's say, when, when we talk, what is that, Kalelus drive? When we talk Kalelus, right? So, the Kalelus records speak of Theodorus as the leader of many peoples who lead the Roman, Romani, Roman, Romani, was that map? Was that, uh, where's my Hoho -ho Khan? All right, what are you going to see right here? The Rodin Kalelus Kingdom. Remember, Kalelus means promised land, literally, or Cibola, or Shimbala, or Shabala. Rodin became Rhode Island over there, but the Rhoda and the Mananan became Maine over there. But the Mananan, I mean, come on, we're about to get a dismount, man. It's dismount season. So, you know, we're talking Kalelus, we're just talking four quarters, all right? Call Theodoric Theory a Mary, a Mary, all right? This is all happening in 775 AD. Man. Or is it happening I-775, you know what I'm saying? We got to put this together. He and his brothers were great warrior Davidic princes of the time of Charlemagne. So we're talking about the seed of David, 775, America. Now here's how it ties back into the Almec. Nehemiah Theodoric Hamakiri, Mark Hamakiri, reigned in Germany. Remember, the Germans are swarthy until his death in 1790. 790, he was one of Charlemagne's leading advisors. He learned about the land of Kalelus from Gerard, a member of the Swan Knight family. Remember, they said Solomon was a member of the Swan Knights. We have it here. Uh huh, Swan Knights. Says Theodoric, 775. Nehemiah, we just got that, right? Reconquered the American Empire of Kalelus, which was ruled by Sylvanus Toltecs. We're just talking the Toltecs, right? I mean, right? I mean, right, right. We're just talking the Toltec, man. The original home in the north from which the Toltecs migrated. We're talking the 
Toltec mythology, Hawaii markets are cool. So all we're talking is Toltec, man. All we're talking is Toltec is Sylvanus Solomon, 775, Kalelus, Kalelus, Arizona. We're getting a dismount, man. Let's go. So Solomon the Builder, the hereditary ruler of this former Hebrew, Ramon Pomegranate, Ramon Pomegranate, a colony. Kalelus was founded in the first century BC by the Babylonian exarch Sylvanus Ogab Solomon, Sylvanus Bravo. All right. And it goes on to talk about soldier and ancestor of the Swan Knights. And that's why down here we're mentioning the Swan Boat. <laughs> Because Solomon had a fleet, right? 770, 790. He married Adele, a daughter of Nehemiah. All right. So it goes on. Giant American empire of Ogam, Ogir, called Juran and Tigun. All right. Juran, Ogam script was later named for Sylvanus Ogam, Solomon II, Shalom. Shalom. All right. Who brought it back from America to Europe. Ogam, Ogam is the legendary home of the Ogir, Ogur, and I believe they refer to the Olmec culture of Mexico. The Olmec culture of Mexico is the Ogam or the Ogir, like they got in Shrek making fun of you. They just mean Olmec. And all this is connected to Solomon or Sylvanus to Texas. All this is connected to Kalelus or Arizona. Or New Mexico, which is all Utah, Judah territory. That's all we digging on. When we talk there, Jesus, 740 years past that is all we're talking about. 740 years past the birth of Kitsukoto or Joshua. It puts the time frame in a whole nother etheric vibration, man. So you go get the rest of the drop, man. Again, love to tie battle for letting us know what the Negro look alike, what the Black and More look alike. This is your family history. This is your regal Negro family history. Wisdom is the conqueror of fortune. X marks the spot. We talking the towel. A robe filled with crosses, cross sticks, towel. Mark, my kid, just surfing the wave, man. Did a black man discover the fountain of youth? Go ahead and take it on home, my sister. So don't have to look very far to see for yourself that Mongolia is not in the Americas. I mean, it is only if we're just talking about the great empire, man. And you know what I mean? Only if we're just talking the great empire. Because Mongolia translates from Greek as the great kingdom, the great empire. And I mean, you tell me, you tell me, where's the great empire? Probably in India Superior, probably in the land of priest King Presta John. And uh, did that Presta John, did that El Presta Juan discover the fountain of youth in this great empire in India Superior? I mean, man, we're just talking the great ones. Mongols translates as the great ones. It's the Moor. The Moor is the Mongol. In the original definition, the great ones, the great ones. Allow wah. And this is a picture of some adorable little ones, some young ones over in the Amazon. Yay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, these indigenous children. And I'll show you a picture from the uh, from the Shinnecock powwow because you've heard me talk about you know Shinnecock as well. This is from 1964, and this is from the collection of the Suffolk County Historical Society. Um, but it's a picture from one of their powwows. I used to make these baskets when I was a child. <gasps> I used to love making these; it was so fun. Um, so that's all. I just wanted to share some of those images with you. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed looking at them. And I am now accepting. Hey, you know, support the sister. She says she's accepting what? Seeing pre-orders for the Ten Commandments book. Yeah. And I'll put the link to the website right under this video. Yeah. And thanks again for listening. 
Notice, man, we are always in the towel. We are always in the towel, man. We are always in the towel, man. We stay in the towel because we just talking about the towel, the cross sticks. Alahua, y'all keep surfing the wave. Baruch Pesai. Shabbat Shalom.